standing in my face so I actually can't see any of you, which is great. Um, it's, it's really great to be back in Amsterdam again without the heat wave because I was here in July. But honestly, even if the weather was the worst it ever was, I'd still be here in a heartbeat to be with all of you. My name is Hui Jing, and today I'd like to go through some of the newer CSS layout techniques, but with the help of DevTools. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to think that DevTools was something that you only invoke when things went wrong. You know, a debugging tool, if you may. But over the past two years, the Firefox DevTools has transformed into much more than just that. And because I use Lightly as my main browser, I sort of experienced this firsthand as an end user. So I'm going to be co covering a couple of things today, so, and I'll also be talking really fast, so I'm sorry in advance. First thing I'm going to talk about is content based sizing. So the concept of automatic sizing has always existed. I mean, browsers have always managed to figure out how much space content should take up without any intervention from us. Content would just over, would kind of just reflow without over, overlapping. But there is a relatively new CSS specification known as the CSS Intrinsic and Extrinsic Sizing Module Level 3, which allows us the option of assigning automatic widths to the elements on our page. So width and height can now take three additional keyword values of min content, max content, and fit content. Now, min content is the smallest size that a box can take, which doesn't lead to overflow. So any inline content will break multiple lines. Now, line breaking might be something that most of us don't give a second thought to, but there is a lot of nuance depending on the language being used. Now, for many languages like English or Dutch, that the line breaks occur at word boundaries, where spaces or punctuation are used to explicitly separate words. Browsers, by default, are not going to break words. So if you look at the first box, you'd see that the word content plus the full stop at the end is treated as a single unbreakable entity, and that ends up being the width of that first box. But for languages that use Han characters, for example, Chinese or Japanese, the break is per character. Most of the time, but not always, because there are rules about certain characters that are not allowed to start or end a line. Now, East Asian scripts also use something known as a full width punctuation. So, if I would say add one here, so if I add a full width comma here, you'd notice that the box is now two characters wide, and that ends up being the width of that box. Now, we also have some Southeast Asian scripts, like Bai, which are written without spaces between words. So text is wrapped at syllable boundaries in addition to word boundaries. And this is a good time to bring your attention to the max content set of examples. So I only personally know one person in the audience who can read Bai. For the rest of us, I think if you don't read Bai, you wouldn't be able to know where the line, uh, where the line should break. But a max content is the box's ideal size in a given axis when there's a lot of space. And content will try to take up as much space as required to lay itself out in a single line. So in the entire sentence, the word prior is the longest in this sentence. So if you go back here, you'll notice that for the main content, the width of the box is the width of the word prior. So you can't read it, but the browser knows exactly where to split the line. Fit content, unfortunately, is not a supported value at this point for width and height, but all three keywords are supported when used in the context of a grid formatting layer. So fit content is not a fixed value like the previous two keywords. It is a range. It is a range between the main content size and the max content size or length percentage defined in the fit content function, whichever is smaller. I'm sorry, that was a lot of words. It's easier to see the, look at the code. So this is how I, it's being demonstrated in the browser. I'm going to just, nope, can't zoom anymore. Uh, so as you can see, this set of three columns, their size, min content, max content, and fit content, 300 pixels, respectively. So the max content size of this run of text is about 482 pixels. Now, when I resize the browser, you'll notice that the fit content column starts to shrink. It'll shrink, keep shrinking, shrink, 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 and hit min content, and that's, that stops there. But as it, starts to, as it starts to grow with more space, it will stop. It will stop at 300 pixels because that's the value that has been put into the fit content function. Now, if we change the cap value to something a bit longer than its actual co max content size, say 500, if there's more space, it will keep growing. It will not hit 500, it will stop 
at the next content wave, and that's what I was trying to describe in words, which is clearly very hard to understand. So hopefully this uh, makes it a bit clearer. Next thing we want to cover, Flexbox, where nobody knows the exact size of anything. Uh, hopefully, after I go through this bit, it comes a bit more clear. So this Flexbox was the first layout model that was specifically designed for building web layouts. So it was a, more, a lot more powerful than some of the previous techniques that we used to have. Basically, it allows the browser to take over sizing based on the amount of available space, which can be confusing at first because the end result may not be what you specify as a CSS length. As for now, Firefox is the only browser with a Flexbox inspector. So we can sort of toggle this. Uh, if you go, you can click on the tag in the inspector section, or you could go to the handy layouts panel, click this pretty blue toggle here, turn it on, turn it off. If you don't like green, I like green. Uh, the default color is purple, but you can change the color of the overlay. The overlay actually shows you the outline of each of your flex items, and any free space as sort of this texture style thing. Uh, additional information include the flex direction, in this case it's row, shows you the wrap status, in this case it's no wrap, but most importantly, it shows you what the browser does to your flex item when it resizes it, and we'll talk about this a bit more in the later examples. Now what I find really cool about Flexbox is the amount of control it gives us over the distribution of free space in the content. So the size of the flex items depends on a number of factors, like the amount of free space available, the amount of content in the flex item, and the starting width of the flex item. So the exact algorithm is sort of complicated, but it's outlined in the specification if you're interested. And the key, I feel, to figuring out Flexbox is understanding exactly how the flex basis property works. Because say I put a value of 100 pixels as the flex basis of a flex item, I think intuitively most people would expect, you know, I expect to see a box of 100 pixels. Because we're very used to being in full control of our sizing instructions. But flex basis is actually the starting point from which the size of a box is calculated. So the key word here, it is starting point. Because if you allow an item to grow or shrink, odds are the final size may not be 100 pixels. So sometimes you may encounter a scenario where the same flex values give you different end results visually. So if we look at the second set of content, I have two flex containers with three flex items each. And the first two items have exactly the same content. We just have much longer content for the second set. Both only have display flex set on the container and nothing set on the children. So it's totally possible to change the different flex values of the children, but by default, they are zero, one, and auto. So a flex grow value of zero means that the items are not gonna grow beyond their starting width. So in this case, there's a lot of space. In fact, there's extra space, but the flex item will not grow to fill up the space because you've told the browser the flex grow is zero, so don't grow. But with a flex shrink value of one, it means that the moment there isn't enough space, the browser's gonna start taking space away from the flex item. So when I start to shrink, when I hit about this point, the second set of content has already started to shrink. So when you hit somewhere here and you look at your flex item, you'll notice that even though the second column has exactly the same content, it's already sized differently because the adjacent flex items do impact the sizing of all the flex items within a flex container. Now when the flex basis is auto, this typically is equivalent to a max content width. When there is no explicit width set on a flex item, meaning when both the width of the flex item and the flex basis is set to auto, the browser is going to use the content size as the starting point. And this is reflected in the Flexbox inspector. So if you see here, it says content size, well, 118. There's some sub-pixel issues here, so let's just round up, because what is math? Um, but if there is an explicit width set on a flex item, so let's do this. I shall highlight this. So let's set a random width, let's say 200, 200 pixels. So once you set a width, explicit width, on a flex item, that becomes the starting point. Go back to the layout. So you see, it's, it's 198 because border box, so one, one pixel borders, it's 200. The browser does math very well, FYI. <laughs> but when there is an explicit flex basis value, however, and we shall set this here, 300. 
with an explicit flex basis value, even though there is a width on your flex item, the flex basis value is going to trump it, and then that ends up being the starting width of your flex item. So if, if you realize that setting a width doesn't give you the width that you want, you maybe check the flex basis value. The next section I want to talk about is the difference between having a flex basis of auto and a flex basis of zero. So again, we have two sets of three items, but this time with exactly the same content. Now all the items have a flex shrink value of one, so they will all shrink at the same rate when there isn't enough space, but there is varying flex grow values. So the values are one, two, and zero, respectively, to demonstrate how free space gets added to your flex items when there is excess of space. So I'm gonna pull this out. So the first set uses auto as the flex basis, which means the starting width for each item is its content width. Highlight here, check layout here. So you can see that the starting size is about 246, but the Flexbox inspector also tells you how much your flex item has grown. So the available free space in this scenario is actually the total width of the container minus all the widths of the contents of the three flex items. So this bit here, if you can notice my cursor, this bit here and this bit here, that's the amount of free space that the browser is working with. So for the first, like, for the first item, you see that it has grown about 136. And for the second one, it's grown about 272. So basically, it grew double the size. But the final size of the first item is not half that of the second one because of the content, the existence of the content width. If you had wanted a scenario where your one item is exactly double of another one, you would want a flex basis of zero. If you look at the second set of content, I'm going to highlight it, when you set a flex basis of zero, the content size is negated. So in the second scenario, the total amount of free space available is the total width of the container minus the mean width of the third item because there's no free space there. Everything else in the two columns, that's up for grabs. So if you look at this, content size is zero, so the item has grown up like 380 pixels. And the second one is double, about, about 760. So that's the difference between zero and auto. And given the use case or the design that you're building for, it is definitely something that you want to keep in mind. Another thing that's cool about Flexbox is the ability to use the box alignment properties. So the Flexbox inspector, again, allows us to visualize the free space, how the free space is distributed. So if I turn this on. So box alignment properties are meant to, were originally meant to be used across all the layout models, but for now it only applies to Flexbox and Grid. And there are a couple of values that we can use to kind of distribute free space in these contexts. So nice thing I like about DevTools is autocomplete. So like if you can't remember any of the keywords, you can kind of just flip through and see like channel changing and see which one fits you the best. But the flex, the justify content property essentially allows you to adjust flex items along the main axis, which is the direction that all your flex items are laid out. So you can kind of move your flex items within the container. You can also distribute the space between the flex items within the container. Now, you can change the direction of flow. So if I change the flex direction to column, can't spell column, and give it a height. The main axis has now been flipped. So the justified content property still applies along the main axis. It's just that now that I flipped it, the direction is a vertical top to bottom instead. Uh, cross axis is perpendicular to the main axis. So let's turn this off first. And items are stretched along the cross axis to the full height of the flex line the moment you apply a display flex on a parent container. So, however, if you apply any of the self alignment properties, for example, I put an align items here, the items are going to shrink back to their original heights. This behavior also applies to grid items. So, if you do a self alignment property on your grid container, you will also end up having grid cells that shrink to fit the content. Now, a very interesting value for aligned items is actually baseline. Because if you have a situation like this where I have flex items of varying heights, varying positions, different font sizes, and the text within each item is sort of related, you can sort of align all the baseline together to make it more uh, easier to read, in a way. Uh, the last thing for flex box in uh, box alignment properties is align content. So say you have a container, 
that is a lot taller than the height of your tallest. Um, ooh, this is not okay. Anyway, um, using the align content property actually allows you to pack your items together and move it along the entire container if the height of your container is way longer than the height of your flex items. Next up. Uh, I can't talk about layouts without talking about grid, so we have to talk about grid. And regardless of whether you've used grid in production or you're just trying out for the first time, the grid inspector tool in Firefox can really help when it comes to just trying out. Uh, the basic usage of laying out grid items is setting the track sizes on your rows and columns. So let's just take a look at the syntax. You apply display grid. Pull it up. Come on. And this is, a, this is a syntax that I'm really fond of because it's kind of visual. So if you see three values in the grid template columns, you see three columns. And then if you see two values in the grid template rows, you see two rows. Fine. Uh, the, most, the browser will automatically place your items into the grid using a very well thought through algorithm, which is defined in the specification. But things being placed one after another is behavior that most of us are fairly familiar with already. What's special about grid is how simple it is to manually place items in both dimensions. And since my favorite analogy for this is placing pieces on a chessboard, this example it is what it is. Uh, so here we have a fairly small 3x3 three three grid, and the position of the grid items in here, these three pawns, it, it kind of works like XY coordinates on a Cartesian plane, right? So for example, if I wanted this pawn to be smack in the middle, I would use a grid row value of 2 and a grid column value of 2. So this is where having line numbers, turn on this, having line numbers from the grid inspector tool is very helpful because for the most part, if you're doing a, like a full page layout or more complicated layout, you're going to be having maybe upwards of 20 columns. You're not just, you're not going to sit there and count on like 1, 2, 24, and then place your grid item there. You want to see exactly where your position is and then put your item where it is. So this is a pretty useful aspect of the grid inspector tool. Another thing that's really useful, uh, another syntax that I particularly like about grid is grid template areas, which allow you to name the areas in which you want your elements to be. So this syntax is pretty nice because it's structurally similar to what we see rendered on the page. Now, I, you can't really see it because in DevTools it's kind of squished together, but in your code editor, you can kind of, you, with, with a monospace font, you can kind of lay it out nicely. Now, each line that is surrounded by quotes represents a grid row, while each value inside the line makes up the grid column. So every line must have the same number of columns, otherwise this whole thing is moot. Uh, so you can change your layout without having to touch the code for individual grid items. You only have to modify the code on your grid container. So here, for example, if I think boat shouldn't pick up four grid cells, what we can do is we can just modify it on the parent container here. So And so just by modifying the code on the grid template areas, I can change the size of the grid item. And I think this is very handy for, let's have a more real world example. Say you have something like this, where it's a, it's a layout, there's standard layout, you have things like a title, content, navigation, etc. When the viewport changes, I can reposition the elements to fit, a, to, to build a layout that fits better, uh, given the amount of space. And instead of going to each individual grid item and adjusting the positions there, uh, I'll just flip it back so you can see, all the code changes are isolated to the code on the grid container. And at the smallest width, you're like, I don't need grid anyway, so just get rid of it. So I think grid template areas is pretty good when you're doing full page layouts, especially for more editorial design. And you can actually use the grid inspector to see how your, your grid items that are assigned to their respective grid area names have been tweaked. Uh, another fun thing about grid lately is that uh, this is a new feature that Firefox started supporting since 66, I think, and it's the ability to animate grid rows and columns. So this has always been into the specification, but it took a long, uh, not long time, some time for browsers to implement this feature. Now when you see something like this, intuitively you think that the grid item is moving across tracks. But that is not the case at all. And only when you inspect it using the grid inspector tool, uh, things become a little clearer, turn it on. 
In actual fact, this example contains a grid container of two rows and two columns with one grid item in it. And what the transition is, what the animation keyframes are interpolating is the different column and row sizes that I've set explicitly. And the grid item's alignment has been set to the bottom right corner of the grid cell. And so it's kind of a full animation across tracks. So this is where having the corresponding dev tool support for a new CSS feature really helped in my understanding of how things worked under the hood. Because sometimes I get the question of which layout model uh, is better, like Flexbox or Grid. And to me, that's the wrong question to ask. So if you can recall earlier when I talked about the box alignment properties, I mentioned that using self-alignment properties would sort of make your content shrink to fit. So if we have a design like this, you have very thick black grid lines that are along, uh, thick borders along the grid lines, but your content does not necessarily fill up the entire grid cell. So for, if I say just highlight this one, for example, it is actually a grid item, but it's also a flex container. And this is necessary because if I did not make this a flex, flex uh, container, let's just remove this, and then I try to do that effect using just box alignment properties on the grid itself. Say, you, you think you'd use like something like align self center. It doesn't work at all because the content shrinks to fit. So it's actually perfectly acceptable to be, do, use a combination of grid and flex. It's perfectly acceptable to make a grid item a flex container. So it's really not about flex box or grid. It's about Flexbox and Grid. And I think that's the way a lot of CSS works. It's about combinations of different CSS that really make the power of CSS shine through. Now, one last thing I want to cover is flexible sizing. I haven't been able to think of a better name for this. But I found flexible sizing a very intriguing aspect uh, of modern CSS layouts. Because previously, we've always used relative units, like percentages, or even the newer ones are viewport units. The issue with those is that they make all of your elements change in size at the same rate. Now, grid introduces something known as the FR unit. It also introduces the min-max function. We've got other intrinsic sizing values, like fit content. We've got auto. And with all of these, we can have something now known as variable rates of change. I'll explain this uh, soon. And all these sizing units are fully supported in a grid formatting context. So all of these boxes, all of these examples are actually just grids. And there, there is a lot of browser resizing coming up, so in case you didn't know, the alternative talk title for this particular talk was, you mean you don't resize a browser a thousand times a day? And so let's, let's start. I'm going to do this and this. So the first thing that I want to compare is FR units versus auto. So there's a handy legend here, green for FR, blue for auto. And FR represents a fraction of leftover space in the grid container. So whenever there is any extra space, it will always go to an FR-sized column. But it's also the first to have space taken away when there isn't enough space. Now, auto is kind of similar and in that it will take up as much space as necessary without breaking lines. So it's a bit of, it behaves a bit like max content, but it's not as rigid because it will shrink when there isn't enough space. So that's how they behave individually, but when used together, you'll notice that auto will cap itself at the max content width no matter how the viewport goes. Fair enough. When there isn't enough space, and space will get taken away from the FR column, taken away, taken away, it will continue to take away space from the FR, meaning that the auto column will hold its max width until there's absolutely no space left before it, it, it itself starts shrinking. Of course, everyone ends up at the minimum size eventually. But in a sense, you can notice how auto is behaving differently from FR already. The next set of values that I want to compare is fit content and min max, because they behave quite similarly. Like they're both a range of values with a maximum and minimum limit. So min max takes two arguments. The first one is the minimum size, second one the maximum. We've already covered how the content works earlier. So if we look at example five, when there isn't enough space, we've already mentioned that the FR column is the first to lose size. So first to go, fit content and auto shrink and hit their minimum size at exactly the same time. Boom. That's all nice and good. The example six is slightly more interesting because that's with min-max 
auto, and then fit content. So the, when the columns grow and shrink are different for all three. So again, a lot of browser resizing. Auto starts off with all the free space when there's plenty of it. So it's also the first to give it up when the space gets taken away. So, as it, so it's the one that starts to shrink more. But the moment it hits its max content size, um, we're here, it stops shrinking. Space instead gets taken away from min-max, which is the uh, yellow column. Space will get taken away from min-max until a random point where all three start to shrink again. I don't know exactly when that point is, but it is the point that allows all three of these columns to hit their minimum size at exactly the same time. So in a growth scenario where there's lots of space, fit content will grow, but it will get capped at its maximum, maximum size. And then after that, you'll notice that auto grows. Auto will grow until it hits the max content size and then it will stop. The space then gets given to the min-max column until it hits the maximum size of 400 before auto continues to grow. So this is what I mean when there's variable rates of size changing. Like column sizes can sort of wait for each other. And I think this opens up a lot more options for editorial design that adapt well to a greater range of viewport sizes. So take this example, it's actually two layouts that look very, very similar at a wide range. The first one, the top one, this is sized with percentages. And the issue becomes apparent when the viewport size gets smaller. Because everything reduces at the same rate. So at some point, you'll notice you probably end up having to write a media query to sort of rejig the percentages. Uh, at, at such a small viewport because it, it doesn't really work very well anymore. Image is too small, text is squished together. But if you look at the one that's sized with variable sizing, it's a lot more robust across a lot a wider range of viewports. And I think that's pretty interesting. It's it's a good it's a fairly good property to make use of. And in addition to that, grid also allows us to do things like say overlap a lot more easily. And that also opens up a lot more interesting combinations with other, not necessarily layout-related CSS, but things like blend modes, things like background clip, masks, to do a lot more interesting things with layout. So this is a very, very crude example of how to use blend modes to overlapping content for more artistic effects across different viewports. So depending on how the viewport changes, the amount of overlap is different. And this is not a hacky overlap because in the past, if you tried to use overlap, maybe use negative margins and things never fit. This is kind of perfectly responsive, if you ask me. And I feel that even though individual CSS properties are pretty good, it is when they are combined together in creative ways where magic can potentially happen. So CSS is evolving and becoming a lot more powerful. Many of the older layout tricks, like nested HTML tables, for example, they are honestly not really necessary anymore. But with layout properties that were specifically designed to suit the dynamic nature of the web, there are new concepts to be learned. And I realized that DevTools can be an avenue to encourage developers to start trying out new CSS features by providing guidance as part of the debugging process. Like Flexbox really clicked for me when I saw how the browser calculated the size of my items. The grid inspector made it easier for me to experiment with more complicated designs because of features like names, like line numbers, supporting of multiple grid overlays, even little UI details like repositioning line number tags at the edge of windows. Shipping new features with corresponding DevTools support is honestly one of my favorite things about Firefox DevTools. And so I would like to end off by saying that if you have been on the fence about trying out these new features because they seem complicated and hard, just do it. It's not as scary as you think. Thank you very much.